Greetings, Artie from Artifact Electronics here. So this was going to be, or is going to be, the final installment on the TRS-80 Model 1. And uh, I was going to show you how to hook up a real disk drive to it, rather than the uh, floppy emulator I was using. But as I started to make some disk images on this, I ran into another problem with the uh, monitor itself. So uh, let's turn it on. And uh, I always saw that the screen, the left edge of the screen wasn't really straight. You couldn't see it with single lines of text. But you can see the end is kind of waving in and out over here. And uh, yeah, I figured some old capacitors, but it's really not that bad. Except that one of the games I found was uh, a Pac-Man clone. It was actually pretty well done. And watch the screen and see what happens here. Look at this. Holy moly. Something in here is getting starved really badly. You can also see it over here, especially on top. Now, the camera, the digital camera will hide a lot of the artifacting in here, but there is screen glitching going on, and that was unfortunately normal, because the TRS-80 Model 1 had dual ported a dual-ported frame buffer, but uh, it wasn't truly dual ported in that the CPU always had uh, priority to get to it and there was no vertical blank signal accessible to the processor. So essentially when you were updating the screen dynamically the processor was just writing data to the screen buffer or the frame buffer asynchronously and uh, the uh, display was free running but whenever it hit the same memory location that the processor was currently accessing, it would output garbage. And now notice the screen isn't getting updated. I don't know how well it'll show up, but it's there's no glitching at all right now. But uh, here we're back to the original problem again. And uh, starting the game, it starts glitching out pretty badly while the screen is getting updated. But again, as I said, that's inherent to this machine. There's nothing... I mean, there's really nothing easy we can do about that. But the screen bending over here, that is not normal. So uh, let's have a look and see if we can make that any better. So things changed. A few days have passed and uh, something that was supposed to be a quick and dirty uh, video uh, turned into something a bit more long-winded. So what happened was this is a TRS-80 monitor. It, uh, in the last uh, scene I showed you the uh, Pac-Man clone called Scarfman, how it was bending the picture on the uh, on the display and uh, I was just going to go in and do some diagnosis and hopefully fix that, but uh, after I uh, was done with that scene, I actually played some Scarf Man, and then the monitor died on me. Completely. Gone. Boom. Now, over the last few days, I've had some other things to do, so I wasn't really putting, or I didn't have a lot of time to put into this. And consequently, also, I worked on it, but I didn't document it properly. And looking at the bits and pieces I had, I decided it was better if I just show you what I did to fix this guy. So let's get started with that. The back comes off pretty easily. It has five screws. One, two, three, four, four, five. And then the whole back comes off. And all you got to do is thread the power cord through. And you gain access to the innards. Now 
Now at this stage, a lot of people would go, oh, let's, let's just recap it first and see if that fixes anything. But for those of you who have been watching, is I generally try to diagnose the problem. And uh, I don't like to just replace parts in a wholesale fashion and then hope that things work. I actually try to find what the problem is. But a brief overview of the monitor. This is actually a... Uh, an RCA black and white TV or started its life as and uh, the uh, the tuner was removed the tuner I think used to sit over here it's been replaced with a video interface board where the uh, TRS-80 video comes in on and is conditioned and isolated you can see the channel selectors back here were removed and there's just a front plate that makes it look as those were never there and other than that it's pretty much a standard RCA chassis with uh, a lot of parts missing over here and uh, I mean anything tuner related was left out and some provisions were made to display the video signal now back to before so it doesn't work the uh, the neck doesn't even light up on this but the fuses are good so when diagnosing a problem like this, I always start with the power supply, always. Even if you think, if you're 100% sure that uh, it's a cold solder joint somewhere or whatever, start measuring voltages. That is just the most important part. And if we look at the schematics, which fortunately are freely available, we have the AC coming in here and being half wave rectified and uh, then there's some filter caps here and uh, we use the tried and true method of uh, old style TVs uh, we don't use regulators uh, we just put a big ass resistor in here and have it drop the required voltage so that we get our desired voltage at the output this is done there's probably four or five power resistors in here that get very hot. I mean that method is extremely inefficient but it was probably really cheap and uh, it generated a lot of heat but if your power resistors had enough of a wattage handling they they lasted for a long time but not forever as you shall see. So anyway we got 133 volts showing up over here and uh, coming in from the AC line and then uh, the uh, B plus voltage for the television set, the main voltage, is 110 volts right here. And the way that is derived is uh, you have your 133 sitting here, then you just drop a shitload of uh, power or you drop uh, some voltage over here and ta-da, you end up with 110 volts and that has its own filter capacitor too. So the very first thing I did was uh, followed my own advice and started to measure voltages. The voltage over here is uh, specified as 133 volts. When I first measured it, it was 155 volts. Ouch. So then I went over and checked B1 and B1 instead of 110 volts was about 10 volts. So that immediately led to an analysis. I mean, do we have, is there a short somewhere in the set that is uh, dragging this down and this resistor is dropping the, the entire difference? But uh, I made an assumption that it wasn't shorted because the fuses were good and they hadn't uh, popped. So if you look at this, the only thing that could cause this voltage to go higher and this to drop way low is if our pseudo regulator over here is uh, has gone I mean if it's opened up or the value has gone high uh, that would cause those symptoms even though while I was measuring it you know I was shuddering because this voltage was way too high and going to the tube but uh, I had to measure the voltages to find out what was going on and uh, so my guess was that something's gone awry with this resistor over here. Now, these resistors, 
there's a nest of them back there and you can probably not see that so let's see if I can uh, get a better camera angle so peeking inside the monitor you can kind of see there's a nest of uh, power resistors back here uh, there's down here there's about four or five of them they generate a lot of heat and they're clustered together real closely so that's I mean they do have the heating vents in front which you can see there and uh, I was wondering where all that heat came from and uh, thought it was the tube but no it's coming from those resistors so the resistor in question basically I measured it and uh, here it is uh, it's, it's rated at 130 ohms and 7 watts but when I measured it out of circuit it was giving me 22k which would uh, explain the uh, symptoms I saw because the, the resistance was so high it, it wasn't dropping enough voltage anymore and turning it we can see that black spot on the back so obviously part of it is beginning to disintegrate or was beginning to disintegrate and uh, the resistance just went up so the first thing I did was I replaced the resistor in question and if you look back here you can see that you know all the other ones even though they're not well lit but they're very discolored but this virgin white one over here is the one I put in I replaced it with a uh, 10 watt part just uh, just because that's the only one I could find I couldn't find a 7 watt and it won't hurt to to up the, the wattage in there and once I put that in the voltages that I previously pointed out to you which I measured here are the two uh, here's a 200 microfarad uh, 250 volt and a 250 microfarad 250 volt cap in the can and uh, once I measured there is a ground lug over here and there's the two voltages and once I measured them the voltages I turned it on the voltages were back to normal I had 133 volts coming in and uh, 110 volts on the actually this is the B plus with 110 and this was the 133 coming in at that point the neck also lit up and um, everything looked fine again before I forget before doing this kind of stuff I actually don't do this kind of stuff there are lethal voltages in here uh, notice that this doesn't even have an insulation cup on the anode I mean it just clips in normally you have your insulation cup on here but I guess they figured uh, that at 12 kilovolts you don't really need to insulate it there's no way that it will arc so there you go looks a little iffy to me but uh, anyway so the voltages came up normal and uh, here's uh, here's what we got on the tube when we turned on the set so here we go turn it on we can switch the brightness and if you look at it real close you can see that we have raster on the screen I mean if a horizontal doesn't work you won't get high voltage and nothing will nothing will light up anyway so it looks like uh, so it looks like things were working but then I plugged in a video source TRS-80 and it looked just like this there was no video whatsoever I checked the TRS-80 on another monitor and it worked I got one of those handheld uh, TV games used that video output and plugged it in here and that didn't work either so uh, obviously we do have another problem and this is one of another one of the main reasons why it took me so long to put this together because I started barking up the wrong tree one thing that I'm used to on these monitors or on on a lot of black and white monitors is that if you turn the brightness up all the way full blast you can actually see the horizontal retrace lines there will be white lines coming across and then flying back and you can see that on a, on a TRS-80 Model 3 you can clearly see that and that'll basically tell you hey the monitor's working but the video source is bad 
But in this case, I could not see the retrace lines. So uh, for a couple of days, I kind of wallowed in uh, a uh, wrong assumption, and that was that I thought the vertical or the I mean, the horizontal was obviously working, but something in the vertical circuit was bad. So I don't know how I came up with it. I checked everything. I tore the chassis out. I checked signals and everything. Everything looked correct. They show you waveforms on the schematics, even though they're shitty representations, but they're close. the waveforms I saw on the scope were close enough. So uh, that wasn't the problem. Hmm. In that case, uh, so what I started to do was... I went to the video board, I mean the video interface board, and let's have a look at that. Here's the video interface and isolator, which is plugged, I'm guessing, into the same place that maybe some of the tuner stuff was plugged in. You can see a lot of unstuffed parts down here. So what happens here, you get three inputs. White is the, the composite video signal, black is ground, but what's this red wire doing here? Well, in order for the isolation to work, we need to power the uh, computer side independently, because what isolation means is it is not allowed to use a ground or a power from the TV itself. And uh, that is very important in this case, because like many other monitors of its era, it had a hot chassis. Well, the hot chassis means is the chassis and the ground, the system ground in here, is actually connected to the neutral wire of the AC input. And in general, with a TV, that isn't a problem because it is encased in a, I mean, it, it's in a case and uh, it doesn't have any inputs. It doesn't have any monitor inputs or there's nothing you can really plug in and cause havoc. So the hot chassis only becomes an issue when you're working on this thing, at which point you should definitely use an isolation transformer. But in this case, they turned this into a monitor. And in order to have safe operation, they had to isolate the hot chassis from the rest. Everything chassis, ground here, that's directly connected to the AC. So that to isolate it. And the way they did that is, think of this board as two halves, the half closer to the top, uh, to the front of the system, got the computer signal, conditioned it, and then ran it through an opto isolator. The opto isolator fully electrically isolates the left from the right side. Then what comes out of the opto isolator is again uh, conditioned over here, amplified, and uh, finally sent out to the main video amplifier which uh, has the video signal riding on top of about 100 volts, and then that, through this wire and a resistor, goes to the neck of the monitor. So I was testing, uh, I had the TRS-80 hooked up to it, and I was testing signals, and uh, it looked like they were getting lost in the opto-isolator. The opto-isolator is a pretty standard part let me see what this is. It's a, um, it's an HP 6N135, kind of op opto isolator that's very commonly used in uh, uh, in MIDI equipment because the input on a MIDI line is opto isolated. So when you're hooking all kinds of instruments together and one of them goes bad or isn't plugged in right or is hot chassis or whatever that it doesn't destroy everything else down the line. So it's the exact same principle they used here. You have a regular diode pretty much on the left side of this that gets lit up uh, uh, proportionally to the incoming signal. The incoming signal is digital, of course. And then at the output, you have an open collector phototransistor that, uh, with the proper circuit circuitry, recreates the signal. What they actually do is the input is runs at 0 to 5 volts, but the output, so the power connections on the opto isolator are actually, it's hooked up to a 12 volt rail. So all of this works in a 12 volt domain until it finally gets out to the final, uh, to the final amplifier. And I injected video signals and 
things started looking confusing. One of the problems is when you're measuring the voltages, you have to make sure that your ground is connected to the right side. If you're measuring something over here, you better have your ground connected to the ground on this side and vice versa over here. And for about a night, I did measurements, got strange measurements, and uh, finally figured out that I wasn't paying attention to which ground to reference my measurements to. Then there were a little more uh, strange things. For instance, uh, this component labeled R3, which is a resistor in the schematic, has a diode in it, and which isn't uh, which isn't really mentioned anywhere. And I was trying to figure out what was going on in here. Wasted time, and I wasn't. My heart wasn't in it because uh, monitor fixing is not something that I'm overly interested in. But anyway, finally I did trace the signal from here. It was a good video signal here. It was getting amplified. It was going in here. And then it was disappearing. Well, that uh, it seemed too easy. And I guess I started looking for other stuff happening and injecting video signals. So I actually injected a video signal on the uh, T on the monitor side. And I started getting a picture. It was really dirty, but I could recognize that this was generating a picture over here. So it could only be the opto-isolator. Well, I took it out. I socketed it because I generally socket things that I replace. I didn't have an exact replacement. Uh, remember, the original is a 6N135 ancient with the gold-plated uh, pins. I had a 136, and the only difference is that the 136 has a better slew rate than the 135. But, uh, yeah, I socketed it, put the chip in, and uh, this is what I got. Okay, let's see how we did. While I was in there, I uh, gave these to the brightness and the contrast controls a squirt. They were very... Uh, jumpy, and as some of you have pointed out, I was very good. I just gave uh, each of them one little squirt and uh, worked them back and forth, and that seemed to fix the problem. It's kind of amazing how people get stuck on something like that. As I did an Xbox 360 fix a few months ago, and apparently I used too much heat uh, transfer paste on it, and I'm still getting straggler comments about why I use that much and that that's not a good thing to do and all right I, I won't use that much anymore but can can we put that issue to rest now along with the contact spray thanks just kidding I that's valuable input to me saves me money because the contact spray isn't very cheap and uh, I just proved to myself that a single half-ass squirt on each of them did the job just wonderfully. So, uh, let's have a look-see. Let's turn off the expansion interface first. Give the monitor power. And turn on the computer. And we are greeted with a very bright and contrasty memory size. But it works. So, to summarize what we did, I can where to go. So piece number one was of course our power resistor over here, which developed the burn spot, went up in resistance from a nominal value of 130 ohms to about 22k, caused all sorts of havoc but fortunately didn't seem to have damaged a whole lot else. The only other thing that we then found was that we couldn't pass a video signal and that was isolated to this isolated pun intended, isolated to this component which uh, is an opto-isolator and that had gone bad. And my guess is that since the actual supply voltage for the secondary side on this is 12 volts, 
with what was going on in the power supply. Maybe that voltage went too high. These things are kind of sensitive to too high of a supply voltage and that may have taken out the phototransistor in here uh, or something else, I don't know. But swapping this, which wasn't a big deal, seemed to fix the problem. So, let us see if we fix the original problem, the uh, waviness or bending of the image on the left side of the screen. And for that, we'll turn on the expansion interface, reset, and, uh, okay, that's not what we want. Let's see if I can find my disk image. There it is. So let's boot off of that. See what Scarfman looks like. And woohoo! It is fixed. So the main problem here was that uh, the supply voltage, the main supply voltages were bad because of the bad resistor. And I don't know when the video thing happened, but that again, that probably happened when the power supply went bad and it took the, uh, took the opto with it. But there you go. So that's fixed. And maybe now we can get to the point, uh, to the part that this uh, episode was originally uh, intended for, and that is how to use a real disk drive with this. Well, I thought things wouldn't be complete if I... We had a quick look at the uh, schematic for the uh, isolation, video isolation board, and uh, what we can see over here is this is where the uh, computer signal is coming in. Let's see, this is ground, computer ground, computer video, and computer 5 volts, which is necessary to power uh, to power the uh, diode in the opto-isolator. Notice that the uh, VCC and ground is tied to the right side on the uh, isolator, and the only thing that get pa gets powered is the input diode. And so the signal comes in, gets amplified and whatever, and is fed to the uh, cathode of the uh, LED inside the isolator. And the anode's tied to 5 volts, so this thing's blinking in here happily. And then we have a phototransistor over here, which gets its power from a 12 volt rail and chassis ground over here. So the hot chassis goes into here, then goes to some amplification and finally ends up in uh, the picture tube out there. But we can see from here that this is perfectly electrically isolated from each other. And that is for the computer in case something goes bad on the TV side and uh, uh, I don't know that the AC cord, it is polarized but it gets plugged in wrong or whatever. Uh, if the AC cord is inverted, we're going to have 100. We're, we're going to have the line voltage sitting on the ground here, and uh, that would take out your computer real quickly, and you with it maybe. So that's the whole purpose of this thing. And the problem we had was things come in, and uh, but they don't go out. So something inside the uh, isolate, the opto was damaged. And that may have happened because of the power supply snuff where that happened, or it was just coincidentally, I don't know, maybe it was on its way out. I don't know why it, uh, it died, but it died, and that was a problem why we were getting any video. What I'm going to use as a real disk drive is I don't have any Model 1 specific drives. These are Model 3 drives. This drive in itself is actually defective. It won't read or write correctly. But to me, uh, one of the big uh, mysteries was... Uh, I do have another drive over here, which we're actually going to use uh, 
well, I'll show you later. It's an identical drive from the Model 3, but that one works. But what I had problems with was the drive selection circuitry. Well, actually, when I first plugged it into power, it needs 12 volts and 5 volts to come in here. The drive just started to run all the time. It wouldn't stop. It, wasn't, it was no longer under computer control. It had the symptoms that happen when you plug a disk drive connector in upside down because you're grounding the entire signal side. But it was con it was plugged in correctly. So finally, after looking, glancing through schematics, the problem was over here in that it didn't have a terminating resistor in it. This is used as an internal drive on a Model 3, and Model 3s have terminating resistors built into the floppy controller. So all I had to do was get a 150 ohm SIP, plug that in, and it stopped just running. Then, however, when I plugged in the cable, I had problems selecting the drive. Uh, I mean, it would always select multiple drives. And after looking at the schematics again, I found the problem. And the problem was the way Radio Shack handled drive selection. So what Radio Shack did was these four pads over here uh, go to the uh, come from the drive selection pins, individual pins on the edge connector, but. You can see they're all, they got traces, and uh, the uh, part they terminate in is shorted together. So what's happening here is basically no matter which select line goes low, 0 through 3, that will always be gated or routed to the uh, chip select on the drive. So it seemed a little mysterious and weird, but the... Uh, you know, the PCB doesn't lie. And what I finally found out or remembered was the way Radio Shack did drive selection was the cable actually did it. So they went in and if this was supposed the zero position connector, 34 pin connector that went on here, and that was in position zero, essentially had the pins for drive select one, two, and three pulled. And only the drive select for for this pin, drive zero was remained connected. So when uh, when the drive selects went low from the computer, only this part was connected, and that's how it properly worked. Same thing for two, three, and four. The uh, irrelevant pins on the particular position of the cable were removed. That's why the cable itself is very special. Uh, for TRS-80s, and they use the same approach on Model 3s and uh, Model 1s. I I wasn't about to build a cable because pulling out connectors from a 34-pin edge connector, as, at least I will always damage the connector doing that. So what I did was I went to a more normal approach. Now a parallel is also with those of you familiar with the PC drives, they did the same thing on PC drives, kind of the same thing, because all PC drives were pre-wired to be drive zero, or, uh, you know, the A drive. But what they did on the PC was similar to this, except you saw that part of the floppy cables on PCs had a bunch of wires uh, rotated 180 degrees between the uh, first and the second connector. And the reason for that was the exact same reason as here. I think it was probably an inventory or inventory management uh, thing that the drives could all be the same. They were all pre-wired to be... Uh, you didn't have to change, you didn't have to supply different floppy drives. You just had to make sure that the proper cable was being used. However, for my purposes, that didn't work because I had the uh, floppy simulator and uh, that isn't set up like this, that actually has uh, drive select shorting blocks on it and all of that. But so the way I solved that was as follows. First, I uh, cut these four connectors here uh, on the PCB. And second, and this is the drive that actually works from the Model 3. I just put in a four position dip switch. So now this gives me a traditional way of being able to select the drive by just uh, closing the appropriate 
uh, diff switch. In this case, it's the first position, so that, that would make this drive zero. And the nice thing about this is that if I ever want to put this back into a Model 3, all I'd have to do is close all of the dip switches. And then we would have all of the drive selects connected properly again. And uh, so I haven't made this uh, incompatible with the Model 3 uh, by making it compatible with the Model 1. So now let's hook this thing up and uh, see if it actually works. All right, we're ready to test. So we have the emulator configured as a drive zero sitting on a protective layer of insulating material. And I, the reason I have to set it up like this is because my cable is too short. We have the actual drive over here configured as drive one using the dip switches that I put in. And uh, of course, we need a floppy disk. Now, uh, one thing you should do with these things before using them for the first time on a Model 1 is to bulk erase them. Because the formatting programs kind of look at your destination diskette, and if they think there's anything like data on them, they want to warn you. But then, if it's like an old format, they can't figure out what the format is, and they sit there forever trying to analyze the disk. And I found it's a lot easier to just bulk erase these to avoid that, that weight. And now we turn on the TRS-80. So what we have here is a new DOS-80 disk. And the standard TRS-80 format is single-sided, single-density, 35 tracks, which gives you about 86k per disk. But, and you know, there's disk doublers, and you can, this is actually a 40, uh, the drive, the floppy drive is actually a 40 track dual density drive. We could go there, but let's make this first disk a standard Model 1 disk. And so once we boot it in, we tell it to copy zero, which is our emulator, to one, which is the real drive. And it wants to know, should we format the destination disk they mean? Are system and source the same disk? Yes, they are. And press enter when destination disk mounted on drive one. And we can see it goes into format immediately. and does its little song and dance. And we're almost done. And uh, the screen says we're done, no error messages. So what we do now is we shut the whole thing off. We unplug the emulator. And we set the drive select to 1. So now all that remains is, will it boot off the drive, the disk that we just made? Can I get everything in the picture? Not really, but just enough of it. And it booted. So, you can run a directory on it. So now what I can actually do is uh, put the emulator in as drive number one and start copying files from there to actual floppy disks and, uh, and build myself a disk library. And let's check out one final game. That's going to be booted off the floppy. So looks like uh, 
Looks like the floppy, 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 floppy controller is working, so... What's on this disc? Bounce, Scarfman, and Frogger. And there you go. We got Frogger. What beautiful graphics. And finally, the Model 1 has sound too. Not really built in, but the way you do it is you plug in the uh, cassette interface cable, which is the third cable over here. And obviously one of those, it has a mini jack with the audio out. And you plug that into a genuine Radio Shack amplifier for hi-fi sound. Isn't that just fantastic? I mean, the music is even recognizable. It almost sounds like the arcade game. Almost. One player, no skill, and do you want music? Of course. Okay. Oh. more difficult. Come on. Oh, come on. How am I supposed to get by that? Score is one of the top ten scores. Enter your name, please. And it saves it to disk. And I'm forever immortalized. All right. So thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. The uh, TRS-80 seems to be back on track, and I will have hours and hours of fun making discs and playing all the great games. And uh, it's definitely worth fixing one of these. It's uh, classic stuff, it's completely useless for uh, constructive work, but it's a great, great artifact. So I hope you, uh, you had a good time. Uh, please support the channel. Use the thumb in the up direction if possible. And uh, subscribe and leave me comments. I read them all, I'm slow in answering if at all, but I do read them. See you next time around.